And so there's two things there. One is, smaller projects that have bigger impact and societal impact kind of get ignored. Also, niche technologies that we can build on for future things will not thrive, will go away. A lot of the things that we're reaping the benefit of today was because of the basic scientific research that we funded in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. So if they stop doing that kind of funding by the government, after a while we just won't have anything to build on top of. We'll just be advertising to each other, and connecting with each other on social media. And that's it. And that's not where we want to end up. So there is a role for government, in terms of promoting scientific research, for both the sake of scientific research and also for commercializing the scientific research. The government is the only entity that can take a slightly longer point of view, in terms of these developments. But I think it's good for that to happen. Because sometimes good ideas need a little bit of funding, before they can become bigger ideas. Facts you read, hear, or study become memories through a process with three main steps. First comes acquisition, the moment you encounter a new piece of information. Each sensory experience activates a unique set of brain areas. In order to become lasting memories, these sensory experiences have to be consolidated by the hippocampus, influenced by the amygdala, which emphasizes experiences associated with strong emotions. The hippocampus then encodes memories, probably by strengthening synaptic connections stimulated during the original sensory experience. Once memory has been encoded, it can be remembered or retrieved later. Memories are stored all over the brain, and it's likely the prefrontal cortex that signals for their retrieval. So how does stress affect each of these stages? In the first two stages, moderate stress can actually help experiences enter your memory. Your brain responds to stressful stimuli by releasing hormones known as corticosteroids, which activate a process of threat detection and threat response in the amygdala. The amygdala prompts your hippocampus to consolidate the stress-inducing experience into a memory. Meanwhile, the flood of corticosteroids from stress stimulates your hippocampus, also prompting memory consolidation. But even though some stress can be helpful, extreme and chronic stress can have the opposite effect.
Most of the world's ecosystems are the result of millennia of covolution by organisms adapting to their environment and each other until a stable balance is reached. Healthy ecosystems maintain this balance via limiting factors environmental conditions that restrict the size or range of a species. These include things like natural geography and climate, food availability, and the presence or absence of predators. For example, plant growth depends on levels of sunlight and soil nutrients. The amount of edible plants affects the population of herbivores, which in turn impacts the carnivores that feed on them. And a healthy predator population keeps the herbivores from becoming too numerous and devouring all the plants. But even minor changes in one factor can upset this balance, and the sudden introduction of non-native organisms can be a pretty major change. A species that is evolved in a separate habitat will be susceptible to different limiting factors, different predators, different energy sources, and different climates. If the new habitat's limiting factors fail to restrict the species' growth, it will continue to multiply, out-competing native organisms for resources and disrupting the entire ecosystem. Species are sometimes introduced into new habitats through natural factors, like storms, ocean currents, or climate shifts. The majority of invasive species, though, are introduced by humans. You see, camels are one of the only animals in the world that store all their fat in one spot. And that's useful for keeping cool in a hot climate because heat can escape faster from the rest of their body, which helps them maintain a lower body temperature. Compare that to other mammals, like humans, who store fat all over, making it a lot harder to stay cool. Today, Camels still use the fat in their humps as a food reserve, but they're not the only ones. In extreme circumstances, the Turkana tribe in Kenya, for example will eat camel fat to survive. They suffer a lot from periods of extreme drought, and I have seen these people, they've been very, very short on food, and this is difficult to believe, but it's true. Slit open the top of a camel's hump, take out the fat for their own consumption, and then put the top of the hump back on again. But don't worry, the camel makes a full recovery and instances are rare. But this practice has started to generate some buzz around camel fat as a new superfood. Turns out, camel fat is loaded with fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals.
Airlines can make a lot of money by flying to the right places. British Airways, for example, long ago cemented themselves as the leader on the London Heathrow to New York JKF route, and flying between these two airports now earns them over billion per year. That's more than any airline makes on any other route in the world. Conversely, though, airlines can lose a lot of money by flying to the wrong places. American Airlines, for example, recently canceled their Chicago to Beijing flight as it was losing them tens of millions of dollars per year. Now, the fact that this route failed might be puzzling considering it flew between the world's 50th and the world's 7th largest city. Even more, they were flying the 787-8 Dreamliner, the smallest plane they could on this route. Nonetheless, it was truly a financial disaster. The airline said that, in terms of annual revenue, the route was $80 million away from their target. The truth is that deciding where to fly is a lot more complicated than pairing up the largest cities. It's an art that people spend their whole lives mastering and the difference between an airline that's good at route planning and one that's bad. This can be the difference between a profitable airline and a defunct one. Coral reefs are some of the most spectacular ecosystems on the planet. They're also some of the most vulnerable. But how can we protect the reefs and the animals and plants who rely on them? And how can we make sure our protected areas aren't hurting those people who use reefs to survive? These are some of the big questions facing marine conservation biologists today. Let's take Fiji, for example. Fiji is a series of islands in the South Pacific Ocean. To help balance the need for conservation and making a living, scientists had suggested that instead of one big park which provides a lot of coverage for one reef system while leaving the rest unprotected, a better way is to create a system of protected areas nested together like pearls on a string. This idea is called connectivity. In this way, scientists can protect lots of different habitats while not excluding people from their traditional fishing grounds. Now, the only way this string of pearls kind of reserve network is going to work is if each park is connected to other parks.
Hair loss can be a sensitive topic for a lot of people. While certain life events and old age can lead to hair loss, sometimes it can be caused by a health condition. One such condition is alopecia areata. Alopecia areata is a condition that can cause your hair to fall out more than normal. The average person can pretty easily lose up to around 100 pieces of hair a day from their scalp with most of that growing back. Alopecia areata is when that hair loss gets more significant and you have trouble getting that hair to grow back. The amount of hair that falls out varies from person to person, but it can be anything from small, rather unnoticeable patches, to greater amounts of hair loss as the patches increase in size and connect with each other. We often think of this as hair loss relating to what's on top of your head, but this condition can also include hair loss in places like your eyebrows and eyelashes, as well as your face and other parts of your body. According to the National Alopecia Areata Foundation, this condition is fairly common, affecting as many as 6.8 million Americans with a lifetime risk of 2.1%. While there is no cure, symptoms can come and go. It might develop slowly, then go away for a few years before coming back. Alopecia areata can lead to alopecia totalis, where you lose all of the hair on your scalp, or alopecia universalis, where you have total hair loss. Generally, when and if your hair ever does grow back, it might fall out again later on. It often first shows up with children, but can begin in any age group. What I've learned is that the most effective people and teams in any domain do something we can all emulate. They go through life deliberately alternating between two zones, the learning zone and the performance zone. The learning zone is when our goal is to improve. Then we do activities designed for improvement, concentrating on what we haven't mastered yet, which means we have to expect to make mistakes knowing that we will learn from them. That is very different from what we do when we're in our performance zone, which is when our goal is to do something as best as we can, to execute. Then we concentrate on what we have already mastered and we try to minimize mistakes. Both of these zones should be part of our lives, but being clear about when we want to be in each of them, with what goal, focus and expectations, helps us better perform and better improve. The performance zone maximizes our immediate performance, while the learning zone maximizes our growth and our future performance. The reason many of us don't improve much despite our hard work is that we tend to spend almost all of our time in the performance zone. This hinders our growth, 
and ironically, over the long term, also our performance. Say you're at the beach, and you get sand in your eyes. How do you know the sand is there? You obviously can't see it, but if you are a normal, healthy human, you can feel it, that sensation of extreme discomfort, also known as pain. Now, pain makes you do something, in this case, rinse your eyes until the sand is gone. And how do you know the sand is gone? Exactly because there's no more pain. There are people who don't feel pain. Now, that might sound cool, but it's not. If you can't feel pain, you could get hurt, or even hurt yourself and never know it. Pain is your body's early warning system. It protects you from the world around you, and from yourself. As we grow, we install pain detectors in most areas of our body. These detectors are specialized nerve cells called nociceptors that stretch from your spinal cord to your skin, your muscles, your joints, your teeth and some of your internal organs. Just like all nerve cells, they conduct electrical signals, sending information from wherever they're located back to your brain. But, unlike other nerve cells, nociceptors only fire if something happens that could cause or is causing damage. So, gently touch the tip of a needle. You'll feel the metal, and those are your regular nerve cells. But you won't feel any pain. Now, the harder you push against the needle, the closer you get to the nociceptor threshold. Push hard enough, and you'll cross that threshold and the nociceptors fire, telling your body to stop doing whatever you're doing. Your posture, the way you hold your body when you're sitting or standing, is the foundation for every movement your body makes, and can determine how well your body adapts to the stresses on it. These stresses can be things like carrying weight, or sitting in an awkward position. And the big one we all experience all day every day, gravity. If your posture isn't optimal, your muscles have to work harder to keep you upright and balanced. Some muscles will become tight and inflexible. Others will be inhibited. 
Over time, these dysfunctional adaptations impair your body's ability to deal with the forces on it. Poor posture inflicts extra wear and tear on your joints and ligaments, increases the likelihood of accidents, and makes some organs, like your lungs, less efficient. Researchers have linked poor posture to scoliosis, tension headaches, and back pain, though it isn't the exclusive cause of any of them. Posture can even influence your emotional state and your sensitivity to pain. So there are a lot of reasons to aim for good posture. <laughs> 